Betty Blackbird is on the run from an arranged marriage to Count Carlo. She hired a smuggler skyship, the Owl, to take her from her palace on the Imperial world of Elysium to the far reaches of the Remnants, so she could be with her once secret lover, the Pirate King, Uriah Flint. However, just before reaching the halfway point of Haven, the Owl was pursued and captured by the Imperial cruiser Hand of Sorrow under charges of flying a false flag. Even now, Lady Blackbird, her bodyguard, and the crew of the Owl are detained in the brig, while the commander of the cruiser, Captain Hollis, runs the smuggler ship's registry over the wireless. It's only a matter of time before they discover the outstanding warrants and learn that the Owl is owned by none other than the infamous outcast Cyrus Vance. How will Lady Blackbird and the others escape the Hand of Sorrow? What dangers lie in their path? Will they be able to find the secret lair of the Pirate King? If they do, will Uriah Flint accept Lady Blackbird as his bride? By the time they get there, will she want him to? So with that premise out of the way, let me introduce you to Lady Blackbird, a tabletop role-playing game designed by John Harper, who made other games such as Ghost Echo, Lasers and Feelings, and Danger Patrol. You can find the 16-page PDF of the game free to download from his website at 17design.com slash Lady Blackbird. It is a collaborative storytelling game for 3 to 5 players, plus a game master. It is improvisation heavy, but we are not making a theater production here, so it is okay to wing it. Unlike traditional role-playing systems like Dungeons and Dragons, it was designed to be relatively low prep for the game master. Mr. Harper advises the game master to not plan out the story, but instead listen to what the characters are saying, then ask questions such that the player's answers may flesh out the character and the world. Assuming most groups would start with the exact same scenario as explained in the premise, the outcome of a game session may end wildly different even for the same group. Others have compared this game to Star Wars, Firefly and Laputa Castle in the Sky, at least in terms of flavor and aesthetics. Genre-wise, it's probably more steampunk than sci-fi, but it can be reskinned to fit the genre of your choice. The mechanics of the game were borrowed from other games such as The Shadow of Yesterday. However, the rules are self-contained. I, for instance, have played Lady Blackbird without knowing anything about The Shadow of Yesterday. Now, a little about the setting. The Wild Blue. Imagine a micro-solar system with a small, cold star as the sun and four major asteroids as orbiting planets with unchanging relative positions. The vacuum of space is not really a vacuum, but is filled with enough breathable air so that a skyship traveler does not need to wear specialized suits, unless, of course, they fall into the toxic cloud layer that will corrode even the metal hulls of their skyships. There are other fantastical elements that make the story not so science-friendly, especially the sorcery part. Your group may decide to make the story more fantasy-like or more science fiction-like. Now, on to the characters. Lady Blackbird's tagline reads, An imperial noble in disguise, escaping an arranged marriage so she can be with her lover. Her given name is either Natasha or something else. Both equally valid interpretations, by the way. I've asked Mr. Harper. In fact, he said many details are purposely vague so that everyone can feel free to make things up. This includes the character's name, age, and gender. On the character sheet, Lady Blackbird has five main traits. Imperial Noble, Master Sorcerer, Athletic, Charm, and Cunning. Under each trait is a list of tags that further define her skills. For example, as an Imperial Noble, she has the advantage of having connections, or that as an athletic person, she was trained in fencing with a rapier. These information provide a guide on what she can do. On the right half of the character sheet, there are keys and secrets. Lady Blackbird has three keys 
that provide a guide on what she tends to do. For example, the key of the paragon means she tends to want to act more refined or dignified or talented than someone not of the noble class. The key of the impostor, on the other hand, means she must also suppress her paragon tendencies if she wants to pass as a commoner. This contradictory pair of keys makes it easy for a player to experience a conflict within the character as she must be feeling, at least in the beginning of the story. The secrets of a character are less known or unrevealed aspects that help them in conflict resolution. In the interest of time, I won't go as in-depth with the other four characters, but their character sheets are just as chock full of possibilities as Natasha's was. Naomi Bishop's tagline reads, Former pit fighter and bodyguard to Lady Blackbird. Her traits, keys, and secrets all seem to depict her as a vengeful killer, but this does not mean the character cannot be more than the stereotypical muscle. Notice that she has tags such as insightful and a possible advanced tag of first aid, so you could mold her into a combat medic instead of a pure fighter. Cyrus Vance's tagline reads, An ex-imperial soldier turned smuggler and soldier of fortune, and also the captain of the owl. His traits, keys, and secrets make him out to be a leader type with a soft spot for Natasha. Did he know her from his past? Or is this their first meeting? No one knows until the subject comes up in play, at which point the players negotiate the details and the game master is advised to let it be true if it makes sense in the context. K.O. Arkham's tagline reads, A burglar and petty sorcerer, also the first mate and mechanic of the owl. His or her traits, keys, and secrets depict the character as a rogue with magical abilities though less powerful than Lady Blackbird. Snargo's tagline reads, A goblin sky sailor and pilot of the owl. This is the wildcard type character that brings crazy surprises and out-of-character laughter to the party, as suggested by the keys. If I were to do a quick analogy of these five character types to the traditional Dungeons & Dragons class system, Natasha would be a mage, Naomi would be a fighter, Cyrus will be a ranger, Kao will be a rogue, and Snargo will be a bard. Now a quick run through of how the game plays. The game master presents the initial obstacle in the story, which is that the group must escape from the brig aboard the Imperial cruiser. Each character will be asked in turn what he or she does at that moment. The game master could be easygoing and let the characters do whatever that's reasonable. Or if the players really have no idea what to do, the game master may ask leading questions or introduce elements to hint at possible solutions. For example, if the player for Kale forgot about the secret of concealment, the game master may ask, Kale, what did you hide in your boots before the guards locked you in the brig? If the player then responds with, Aha, they didn't search my boots to find a set of lockpicks so I'm going to pick this lock, to which the game master will decide on a difficulty level for this obstacle. Let's say the difficulty there is 3. The rules explains conflict resolution this way. When you try to overcome an obstacle, you roll dice. Start with one die. Add the die if you have a trait that can help you. If that trait has any tags that apply, add another die for each tag. Finally. Add any number of dice from your personal pool of dice. Your pool starts with 7 dice. Roll all the dice you've gathered. Each die that shows 4 or higher is a hit. You need hits equal to the difficulty level to pass the obstacle. If you pass, discard all the dice you rolled, including any pool dice you used. If you don't pass, you don't yet achieve your goal, but you get to keep the pool dice you rolled and add another die to your pool. The game master will escalate the situation in some way, such as giving the character a condition like injured or hunted, and you might be able to try again. Back to Kale and the lock. The player for Kale starts with one die, then chooses the trait burglar, then the tag locks. If the player sees the tag quiet 
and adds to the narrative that K.O. uses a piece of cloth to muffle the tinkering noise. Personally, I say that is justification enough for using the tag quiet, so the player gets to roll four dice for that obstacle. If the odds don't look too good, maybe use some dice from the dice pool. Cyrus could offer to shield K.O. from watchful eyes, which is enough justification for the player of Cyrus to give one of their pool dice to the player of Kale. This game mechanic is called helping. Suppose the player for Kale rolled six dice with three successes. Then the game master declares that the lock is open without alerting the guards, and both players of Cyrus and Kale are down to six pool dice each. What happens when you run out of pool dice? And how do you advance your character? The rules explain it this way. When you hit a key, you can do one of two things: take an experience point or add a die to your pool up to a max of ten dice. If you go into danger because of your key, you get two experience points or two pool dice, or one experience point and one pool die. When you have accumulated five experience points, you earn an advance. You can spend an advance on one of the following. Add a new trait that is appropriate in context. Add a tag to an existing trait. Add a different key, or learn a secret that makes sense in context. Let's continue to use Kale as an example. The player for Kale hits the key of greed when Kale steals something cool in the narrative. Suppose the group manages to sabotage the cruiser to a point where it begins to sink into the cloud layer, when everyone else is trying to flee. Kao may be happily picking away at a strong box in Commander Hollis's office. If I were the game master, I would give Kao's player the option of two XP, two pool dice, or one XP and one pool dice. On the other hand, if the player for Kao really hates this key and wants to reshape the character into someone more upstanding, then they may play a sort of monologue scene for Kao where he swears off stealing forever. Which is the so-called buy-off condition for the key of greed. The player receives two advances instantly for the buy-off, but would never again benefit from having the character steal anything in the story. One last part of the game is called refreshment. The rules explain it this way: you can refresh your pool back to seven dice by having a refreshment scene with another character. You may also remove a condition or regain the use of a secret, depending on the details of the scene. A refreshment scene is a good time to ask questions in character, so that other players can show off aspects of his or her character. For example, why did you take this job? Refreshment scenes can be flashbacks too. For a one-shot game that takes one to three hours, a game master can afford to be very generous with giving experience points. And or allowing flashback scenes, even in the beginning scenario, if the goal is to have multiple sessions of the game with the same group of players, then the game master might want to hold back on advancing the players too quickly, or the tension of potential failure will be gone. I hope that was somewhat helpful. My goal is to prepare you to play the game before actually reading the rules, as I know many of us prefer to learn by doing. But in this case, the PDF is very nicely laid out and probably shorter to read than being read to by an amateur gamer. Anyway, thank you and go play.